But then they were like, oh, Manu Tuolangi didn't run, run over 500 people or Semi Randrada didn't offload through his legs. Like, I thought it was a bit harsh, to be honest. Like, Randrada is clearly one of the best players in the world. And I think, I think they've got a bit on him too quick. If it Brad Shields can offload through his legs. <laughs> if Brad Shields can offload through his legs, then I think Sam <laughs> Randrada can. <laughs> Hello, Marcus Smith should be the fly half for England in the next World Cup, and this is the Ruck and Mall podcast. Uh, on this episode, um, Super Rugby Aotearoa ends on a high, and over in Super Rugby AU, um, the Reds comfortably win, and the Four still can't buy a win at all as the Tars continue to win. And popping into the Premiership for the first time, Magic Marcus, Stars, Gloucester put the hammer down, Exeter push past the Tigers, Bath drive over Irish, Bristol lock stock and snatch a win over Saracens, and Wasps buzz past the Northampton Saints. Um, lads, um, how are you doing? And the first question to you is, should we all dye our hair blonde? Because I've, I've missed something, but there was uh, a lot of people with dyed hair this week, this weekend. And the mullets as well. It's like... Uh, it's some done. It's super like, it's ridiculous. I think people, are, rugby players in particular, are slowly realising that they're not employed to look. They don't generally have to look professional. The England captain does. Some of the people who do a lot of marketing work, the rest of them, it does not matter. Ex the Chiefs players knew this a couple of years ago. But I think slowly but surely it's moving into the rest of rugby. And I love it. <laughs> I love it. Unless you're Reese Priestland and you dye your hair blonde and then don't have a good game. Yeah, you've got to, you've got to play well, haven't you? Um, yes, that's not when you go like that. Can we just on Reese Priestland? Just can we just get this out of the way from the first start of Premiership? How many fly halves drop the ball from a simple scrum scrum after fly half pass? Like a routine from the back of a ruck, straight there. Rob the pre drop run, Priestland drop one. Bigger, bigger definitely drop one. That was a clang he did in the water. Furbank, Furbank drops one, but. At full back and just like dropped it forward. I've never seen anything like it. Um, but yeah, in, in general, it, across the weekend, there was quite a lot of knock ons. It was a bit wet to be fair, but yeah, yeah I think awful. this is the first This is the first weekend it's rained since these guys came back to play rugby. I think it's, there's, a, there's a degree to which it's just they're not used to it. Like nobody expected it to be raining this weekend, it's been 30 degrees all week, yeah. So there won't have been like the not that training that they normally do where they put fairy liquid on the balls and stuff like that. They haven't been doing that for the last three months. I've just been chucking it around. So I suspect yeah. a little bit of complacency there, but it'll get better. And I, like a lot and, of these things. It'll get better. And of course, we've obviously got water breaks when it's pissing down with rain. So that's very important. I did enjoy taking the water break, having spent five minutes to determine Nanai's red card. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we'll we'll take the water break after you've taken the penalty kick. For this <laughs> Perfectly reasonable. It, my my highlight was uh, in the Bath Irish game where they go. Um, you hear it in the comment on the commentary, just going, oh, we'll, we need a wa- we'll take a water break uh, now." It was um, Max Cresswell Keys, Cresswell Keys, and it's like, "Yeah, as long as Irish don't go quick." I was like, "Am I fuck gonna get Irish gonna go quick? Come on." <laughs> um, We'll talk about them yeah. later on, but let's get into it then. Um, what we're going to do in this podcast is we're going to wrap up Super Rugby RTRO in a moment. We're going to quickly look over Super Rugby AU because it wasn't a particularly eventful weekend. And then we'll go through, the, obviously, the return of the Premiership and discuss, obviously, that incident um, with uh, Johnny May. And hopefully we can get a bit more from um, the, the resident Gloucester correspondent, uh, Joe Tricky, on that later on. Um, but let's get into Super Rugby Aotearoa. Unfortunately, due to um, COVID-19 sneaking back into New Zealand, uh, the Blues who said his game was off um, as Lord Auckland went into a level three lockdown. Um, but the Hurricanes and the Hinders gave us an absolute classic of super, what Super Rugby is all about with a 38-21 victory. Not going to lie, I didn't think the H- H- Hinders were going to end on, on, a, on a real high, but... Brilliant, brilliant game. Some absolutely lovely tries. Two coast-to-coast tries. Um, a Peter Munger Jensen pounced on a mistake from Mitch Hunt. Hunty's then gone 50 metres. That was unbelievable pace. Like, we talked about him. We talked about him for so long that he's absolute pure gas. And um, Hinders again, big old Shaz. Shaz Rizal. 
gets himself another one. Just again, it's brilliant, brilliant competition. Very pleased the Highlanders to go off on a, out on a high. Um, overall, great competition. Boys, anything on that game before we do our sort of conclusion and wrap up on that? Yeah, I think it was just a, another another good game that we've come to expect. Um, you can, I think you can tell that the teams are probably reaching the extent of their um, energy reserves sometimes in defence and some sort of defensive decision-making a couple of times, people not coming around the corner and slipping off a couple of tackles that you'd normally expect them to be making. But otherwise, yeah, fantastic game. Another great advert for the sport in general and New Zealand rugby in particular. Yeah, it was a really good game to watch. And they were saying it before they started that, although there's no fans in the stadium, we hope that they kind of finish this one on a high, and they did. Um, could have been a few more tries, though. Vince also is not that used to running along the wing. A couple of times stepped out into touch, which is a bit frustrating as a as a as somebody who's supporting the Canes in that match. They could have gone a f- quite a few tries ahead at one stage. Um, but because they didn't, Harland has managed to stay in touch and then took the game back, um, took control of it later on. But um, yeah, in general, just loads of loads of really interesting rugby to watch. Because as I said, like the, the the competition itself has been absolutely fantastic, and uh, we we put a post out I think earlier in the week uh, this weekend I think just about how at a time when COVID nineteen has basically gone through um, countries and how New Zealand have adapted to it and put on such an amazing show, not only just for us as like hardcore rugby fans, but also just guys that would just want to watch some sport. The quality product that's been there is absolutely fantastic. I don't know um, where they'll take Super Rugby RTRO. Obviously, hopefully the Mitre 10 um, competition, which is due to start in the middle of September, can get going. I'm sure it will. I'm sure New Zealand are very good at... They've, they've shown in the past they can get COVID-19 under control so hopefully we can uh, see some more fluent attacking uh, New Zealand rugby to come um, let's just we want I wanted to do two things really with to wrap up Super Rugby Artero and that was do our breakout stars and then do a players like an MVP of the competition and then in a separate post uh, we're going to do after this podcast it will come out with our team of the team of the whole tournament so again check out there um, newsflash there's a couple of surprise ones that will probably um, take a lot of people by surprise but um, Joe do you want to start with your breakouts if we do breakouts first and breakout stars so these I thought the conditions for this could be but they might these are players that other players from maybe the Northern Hemisphere certainly us have not heard of they might have been playing Super Rugby for a few seasons they don't have to have come in Super Rugby RTRO and just gone bang hello this is our first game but just on like young players is what I'm kind of getting to in here. Yeah, well, you can probably guess who mine's going to be because I've been speaking pretty much about him and only him for the last few weeks. But mine's going to be Peter Umanga Jensen, just because uh, he's really he he kind of has emulated that almost um, smacked onto the, the the big screen in this tournament um, and has gone kind of straight to the top of all the headlines. He's he's taken some of Keynes's games by by the horns and and almost won it for them in the last few weeks. It's been awesome to watch, and you know, for me, he plays my position and does exactly what I'd, I would want him to. So, it, it, when I'm looking at a, uh, when I'm watching a game, I'm kind of looking for those players anyway, and he stood out um, even without that. So, yeah, Emmanuel Jensen for me. Yeah, I think uh, Emmanuel Jensen is a great shout, and following in the line of a sort of nice succession there of really, really high quality Hurricanes 13s. Um, so, there's something about their system or just the talent production down there that it's got some really fantastic players. Um, I have so many people for this that it's been an unbelievable tournament for um, ex- sort of really highlighting how good some players in New Zealand are and giving them an opportunity when really the whole rugby world is, has been watching this tournament. Every Like everybody f- who has a, let's say more than a passing interest, proper rugby fans, everybody has been watching this tournament. Um, and we're all scared of the All Blacks, even more so. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, Jesus. I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. It's terrifying. Um, because I don't think the same would happen if you just played English rugby and the same level of talent would not be on show, let's say. Uh, but my um, breakout star of Aotearoa is obviously Hoskins to Titu. He's my favourite player in the world. 
Um, I mean, sorry, Carl Sinclair. We've already talked about oh, how great you. Oh, are. Carl Sinclair's <laughs> gone. Um, I have slightly more skill set in common with Kyle Sinclair than <laughs> Satutu. Um, my touch isn't quite as good as uh, Satutu, but yeah, no, just all everything you want from an eight ball carrying hard work makes an enormous amount of tackles for a guy that really pops up as being an offensive weapon he's he's not just that he's got all the work rate all the defensive nous and just game intelligence that you'd need from a back row player on top of that fantastic footballing skills some that grubber kick that he did to be fair it was earlier in the super rugby season but he sh- he showed more of, more and more of that. The power, the pace. Oh, I sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, Honorable I'll... mentions. Uh, we'll probably do them at the end, but I have certainly got a couple. Uh, Johnny, who's yours? Mine. Mine would probably be Will Jordan. I think it's a tough one, but I think for like as a breakout player, like. We knew kind of from the start of the season, from the initial Super Rugby, that he was a he was a quality player. But he's just been so consistent, still caught, like scoring loads of tries. And I think if we're going to talk about All Blacks, if he doesn't make the All Blacks squad, next All Blacks squad, I will be quite shocked if he's not in there. Not necessarily making the first 15, but if he's not there or thereabouts... I just think he's so consistent and like he's shown that he can do it on the wing and at fullback. And he, he never looks stressed and I don't know, just his all round game, um, especially running those support lines. He's so good at just like picking off of, of someone's break, just running those support lines to score those tries. Um and he's twenty two. That's what like he's only twenty two. He's got so many years ahead of him. Um uh, and just shows that the depth they have at fullback, kind of Mackenzie and Geordie Barrett and Bowden Barrett potentially. Like there's 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 so much, so much depth. Yeah, I think fullback is one of those positions that New Zealand will forever p- pump out players with just world absolute world class levels of ability because it's probably the position on the pitch maybe second to fly half, or so, maybe even more so where game intelligence and judgment of the line to run, because a fullback has all sorts of options in terms of where he appears in the back line, the, the time that he decides, right, right, this is when I'm going to make my impact. He can make that, he has so much freedom to make that decision. So it's really not a surprise that New Zealand have so many of these good players, but Jordan is one of the best that we've seen for a really long time. And he's similarly to Satutu. Somehow they man they managed to marry this amazing game intelligence with the physical talents as well. Mm. Jordan and this applies to Mitch Hunt as well, but they're so fast. Faster than anyone else on the pitch, which is surprising because they're all world class athletes really. But then some of them are just another level. It's fantastic. Yeah, as I say, for a guy at 22, he scored six tries, topped the tries, carries 95, same as uh, Peter, uh, Peter Cus, uh, Socolo, uh, Mario Makatatui. Um, clean breaks 15, top that. Defenders beaten 39, top that. And then his metres carried is ridiculous. He's 724 metres carried, according to Super Rugby. Uh, second place is uh, DMAC on 489, and then Jonah Narecki on 470. Like oh, Jesus, what, what I mean, obviously, player. obviously, a lot of those meters carried stats are um, slightly fluffed by the fact that they're running back kicks. But the fact that Jordan is another hundred meters ahead of the next person on that list, it's not like people kick to the Crusaders more than they do other teams. They'd rather not kick to the Crusaders because they know that Will Jordan's back there, <laughs> and he still makes all this ground. Yeah, crazy, crazy. Um, he was definitely up there for me as the breakout stars. Um, oh, do I go? Um, hmm. Oh, do you know what? The guy who's really, really, really taken it from me is Caleb Clark, I think. Um, it was uh, honourable mention to Duplessis Karifi because I think he's been absolutely phenomenal 
um, at seven for the Hurricanes. Um, but Caleb Clark is an absolute game changer at 21. Just so quick, so powerful for a young kid, just taking on the reins. He can clearly see he'd be able to cope with um, being in the All Blacks team. Hopefully they give him a go in the squad and we'll see what happens with the international rugby. But for me, um, he is a phenomenal, phenomenal player. And he's going to have a great future because he's got the skill set. He's got the ability. He's already got the differentiation of um, the, his, the side step, his power. They, there was a lot of talk at the early, and I think and Harry talked about Mark Talea. And I'm not, not saying Mark Talea isn't a good winner because he's a very, very, very good winger. But Mark Talea, if you compare them, has had a relative... He had a good first two games, don't get me wrong. And he's at a steady competition. But Caleb Clark has taken that mantra away from him and sort of, oh, look at me as opposed. So for me, he's by far one of the best wingers in New Zealand at the moment. Just an incredible, incredible player. Um, players of the competition then. Um, who wants to come in on that, first of all? So this can be anyone you really, really think that's been a game-changing superstar. I think... I'm going to need some persuading for it to not be Richie Moonga. Yeah. Yep. Now, there, to be fair, there are other options. James Parsons. Come on, James Parsons, surely. He got injured later on and didn't play the game. I'm only joking. That was I James that was, Parsons. I think he's fantastic. That, yeah, that on. was my angle to be persuaded. Some of those guys who didn't play the whole tournament, but when they did were... Anyway. Um, yeah, Mwunga, there was a, a post that um, one of the other uh, rugby sites put up that he leads the tournament in an enormous number of the attacking stats, even defenders beaten, which is not really a normal fly half attribute that they would generally excel in. He's right up there. 35 you, defenders beaten. Yeah. 35 from a fly half. Yes. Yeah. Just absolutely fantastic. Um, and has steered this Crusaders team. It was probably not a, not an easy job. As as good as the system is, you've got to be able to execute it and bring all of those other great players into the into the equation, and then also kick all the points, which he does now. His kicking was a bit of a um, bit of a concern for the All Blacks, but I think he's been better in Artero. Maybe it's a sort of condition team what he's more used to. But yeah, he's, I think Richie Moonga for me. Can not argue with that? It would be Richard Moonga for me. I'm, I'm not even going to try and argue someone else. But yeah, I just think yeah, it'll be interesting again at an All Blacks level to see what happens off the back of this because he's still not popular after the semi-final win at the World Cup in Japan um, to see what, what happens with that fly-half position for New Zealand because Barrett's clearly better at fly half than he is fullback. Um, and you kind of got to have him on the pitch. It's it's a, it's a nice dilemma to have. Yeah, quite a quiet competition, all things considered. Broden didn't he really? I think Richie outperformed him by quite a long way. Yeah, I'm yeah. Just... I, oh, but Broden certainly wasn't even on my list of others to consider. He's been very good, and there are a few players in the world who can do what he did as well as he can do, but there's no one really at the moment who's playing as well as Richie Moana. Yeah. Johnny, did you want suggestions or do you want us to say who we thought our best player was? Say, say who you think it, think it is and then I was just going to put a post together and people can vote. I think realistically, my, mine, Rich, Richie Moana is is brilliant. Will Jordan's been brilliant, but yeah, just, it'd be nice to talk about other people as well that, w that maybe won't get a recognition on other on other platforms. So yeah, yeah my, my second choice is certainly Aaron Smith. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. that's similar for anyone else. Um, yeah, that, he was gonna, I was going to say him as well. I think Aaron Smith's been yeah. amazing. Led that Highlanders team really well, and almost like, like he's added running running to his game that we've not really seen before. Maybe the, the system has freed him up more than the All Black system does. Um, but we don't we generally don't tend to see him running with the ball and making too many metres on his own. But we've we've seen that from him and he's been fantastic. I, I was just gonna say very quickly on Aaron Smith. Um he he's one of the main focal points why the Highlanders have done so well. Um they they realistically predicted at the start um that they were gonna come last. 
Um, and not, unfortunately, when we decided who we, which which team we were going to support, we kind of went, oh, we'll, we'll support the Highlanders as a group because they'll need the support. Because <laughs> admittedly, and they, they'll admit it themselves, they were dreadful in Super Rugby um, 2020. Uh, but in Super Rugby Artero, they've been fantastic. I, as I say, Aaron Smith has led it from start to finish. He's scored tries. He's looked... He's looked like a 22-year-old coming onto the scene. Um, but it, at 30, like, that's not saying he's old at all, but he's still got a lot to offer the All Blacks and the Highlanders going forward. Whether he'll pick up a contract in Europe, I'd love to see him in Europe um, eventually. But for now, he's still got a, a, a lot to offer New Zealand and um, the Highlanders. Yeah. Do you want to move it on? Anyone else got anything else on that? Or should we move on? Lovely, jubbly. Super Rugby AU then. Um, very quickly, I'll just run it. I don't really, really want to go too much into these games. And then if I'll go through what I wanted to get across. And then if anyone else wants to chime in, that'd be great. Uh, so Force Tars. Tars won comfortably 28-8. Uh, Richie Kahui probably scored the, one of the, uh, set up one of the tries of the season. His lovely grubber kick, 35. He just knocked it through. Um, and it's um, Stowers that's gone over. Was it Stowers, I think? No, San yeah. um, Stander. Um, not a relation to CJ, but gone over the corner. Just a super, superb finish. Harry, did you yeah, want to say so I, I turned, Just that I, I turned that game on for five minutes, and the, the five minutes was that try being scored and then replays of that try <laughs> because it was that good. Um, just a guy you got nutmeg. I feel sorry for him because that's going to be shown so much. Nutmeg, and then an end over end grubber that does f five or six bounces in a dead straight line, a foot less than a foot from the touch line, to then be dotted down to scoop for a try from a guy that the force picked up two weeks ago. A yeah, week yeah, ago? ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. He, was the, he was in the rugby role. wilderness. Uh, Richie, Richie Kahu, he just crazy, crazy, crazy. Brilliant, brilliant. You can't, te you can't teach that. No. It's no, just you, so good. That's sort of ingrained in that. Um, apart from that, really, Tars look pretty good. They're on, got on collision course. Irish bound, Rob Simmons nearly got himself a try. I think it was then ruled out. Um, there was unlucky they nearly had a quality try from Maddox Hooper's put the ball beautifully back inside but uh, the Tars props obstructed the covering defender so that was ruled out so they really should have had more tries um, someone we've not really mentioned is uh, Carmichael Hunt who's come across from uh, the NRL for a few years now Never has never really stood up but he was really good for the Waratahs from what I saw there some really nice transition play at 12 so yeah, they they continue on. They're up to third now, um, and they're well in they're in well in position to get themselves into that playoff spot. Um, a team that maybe have done themselves a little bit of a damage to their playoff hopes is the Rebels, who lost nineteen three. Um, Red, Red scored some nice tries. John Bataille's lovely cut back inside um, was really really nice. Uh, but from what I got from the game, is the Rebels just weren't in the game whatsoever, um, and they can just brush themselves down and go again. Uh, currently, the table looks like this. Brumbies, 18, top, Reds, Tars, Rebels, and the Force. So it's all to play for with the second, third playoff. It's, um, it's quite exciting over there, really, to keep you if you, want, if you want some rugby in the morning. Yeah, just briefly on that um, Reds-Rebels game, it was quite a... If you've watched much of particularly the Rebels, it's one of those games that just happens to them every so often. Like, it's... They, they don't have too much... Uh, variation in the starting team that they put out because they have got some recognised stars, some recognised wallabies. Um, obviously, not quite, to, not quite to the level of the Reds or the Waratahs, but they they should have enough experience there that their performances aren't so up and down. But then there are just some games where they just they just don't score any tries. I think it's it's another thing. It's something that Reese Hodge is is a very very good player. But there are just some games where he, and it sort of spreads, not so much spreads to the rest of the Rebels team, but is emblematic of the rest of the team where they just can't really get anything going. And obviously it's a credit to the Reds that they caused that to happen this weekend. But it's a frustration that happens. To be fair, this game was also very, very wet, very slippery. Um, both teams struggled a huge amount with the handling and it was just um, the Reds that dealt with it better. But the Rebels are a bit brittle like that. 
Um, and then just briefly to round that off, another unfortunate injury for Hunter Paisami. Um, from the sounds that he's done that same knee ligament that he did uh, to cause him to miss most of the original season uh, that we were playing earlier this year. So fingers crossed that he gets um, better as soon as possible because he was absolutely fantastic last season and early on in this season and briefly in this AU tournament. So another great young player that Australia have that hopefully his career won't be in any way chastened by these injuries. Yeah, as I say, he's he's definitely caught the eye when it when I've seen him play. So hopefully he can, he can uh, come back as soon as possible. Um, but let's move into the Premiership then. So the Premiership's back as we made a massive um, deal about on our two-hour-long marathon on Wednesday. Um, let's start very quickly then, just sort of go on chronological order really, because I like that doing that. Uh, Quinn's sale on Friday night, sixteen ten. Uh, Quinn's looking relatively good. Marcus Smith is clearly the best fly half in the world. Um, there's no doubt about that. Oh, sorry, I should know. Uh, under 21. Um, he's definitely the best fly half under 21, under 21 in the world. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, he, just to start on him, I thought he was absolutely fantastic. Just, we've seen a lot of him, how he likes to attack the, attack the line. He's quite similar to Josh Iwani for the Highlanders that, that going to the line and uh, offloading where he didn't really sort of always, if they, the pressure was put on him, which the sale defensive line certainly was, um, he didn't kick, hasn't kicked in the past in behind them. But this week, just loads of times, they were just high press. Nah, I'm all right. Stick it over the top. The wingers have pressed up too much. Massives of space in behind. Hammersley can't cover it all and they get good field position. And sale, but who didn't, who weren't particularly great, never really got going and made very ridiculously amounts of mistakes. I think it was like 10 penalties in the first half, at least. Yeah. I mean, they were averaging a penalty every two minutes. You can't. You can't. Yeah, their discipline at, at, at the breakdown was terrible. It was really bad, um, especially in the first half. And they were just, it was a lot of going off your feet and not supporting your own body weight. And it was kind of stuff that, Yes, it's new interpretations, but they were just a bit rusty. Clearly, hadn't played a competitive game for a while. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we were we were expecting there to be a degree of increased penalty count, which we did see um, in these games from what we'd seen at the beginning of the Arturo and eighty AU tournaments. Uh, that these new breakdown laws are a bit different, and they are quite hard to immediate. They they're not they seem to be a bit difficult to adjust to on the training ground. You need to be playing a live match with full contact tackle situations because these players ending up on the wrong side of the ruck, which would maybe previously have been not quite ignored, but allowed to uh, give them more time to get themselves out of the way or a bit more leniency. Um, so we knew there would be more penalties, but some of the some of the mistakes that Sale were making were not they weren't the new laws; they were the old laws, just rustiness. Uh, so. I would I would be very surprised if that lasted much longer, given what we know about Steve Diamond. But yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a shame for that first match, that headline match, to have been marred like that. Yeah, it was just like I don't. I was kind of sat there. I was kind of a bit annoyed, really, because we were half an hour in, and Sal had one real clean break when John O'Ross got in behind. And I was like, fl- turned to Martin, and Martin Martin's like, oh, tell me about him. I was like, yeah, he's going to cause havoc. Like I was like bigging up the Dupree brothers. I was bigging up to Alangi. I was bigging up the second rows, their options. And he turned to me after 40 minutes and was like, well, this is crap. Should we put the football on? And I thought, <laughs> to be honest, I generally wish I'd watched Barcelona get destroyed because that's exactly, that was, that was almost a rugby score in that game. Well, I watched them both and I was spending a lot more time on the football <laughs> side of the sort of screen diameter that I had than I was watching the rugby. It was... It's a it was just like, all Sale needed to do really in that game was, all they had to do was get to the ruck get to the ruck, go around the corner, but they weren't, they just couldn't do, they just weren't doing the basics of what they were known for. They were trying to go a hundred miles an hour in a game where, admittedly, yes, everyone's coming back from injury. Every team this weekend has been rusty. Um, some teams have done much better than others, and we'll talk about those later, but Sale just need, all they needed to do, they, they've got the squad to beat Quinns. Quinns weren't at full strength. Sale, apart from um, not having Rand Bensberg at 12, were probably at their, the strongest team they could put out. 
at the moment. I thought Hill actually had a very good yeah, game there. I thought out of all the well. sale, yeah, people yeah. Yeah. actually the best, one of the best. Yeah. But they'll, they'll come back. I think Sale will definitely, when they click, they're going to be seriously, seriously good. Um, let's, let's talk Worcester-Gloucester, the biggest scoreline of the uh, weekend. That was next up on Saturday. Um, 44-15. Tricky, you must be buzzing. Well, I mean, happy, but you've got to take it all with a pinch of salt. And anybody that watched the game will know that. I think Gloucester played well, but um, until basically until the red card, which was earlier on in the game, it was very even up until that point. And Gloucester were making typical poor mistakes that we have done. Conceded right at the start of the game, where just Cipriani and uh, May both left the ball to each other and Ted Hill came through the middle. So typically, typical Gloucester mistakes being made from the off. And I thought, oh crap, it's going to be one of those days. We're going to lose to Worcester. And then that... Um, that red card obviously blew it open a little bit, and it was a red card. I don't know anyone that's seen it. It doesn't wrap. It's, it's a straight shoulders to the head, and Johnny May didn't quite rightfully didn't come back onto the pitch. That I thought at one stage that he was going to stay on, which would have just been like bizarre. But yeah, Gloucester did play well and basically just used the space that we had after that. So Thorley scored a few decent tries from kicking in, in, in behind and just making use of the space. And there's a few tries there that I think would have been tries with 15 or 14 men, but would certainly made just a, a whole lot easier by playing against 14 rather than 15. So although it's a big scoreline, I think that's, that's probably been taken out of proportion. Um, and I don't think we really get a picture of what we're like at the moment and what we're like with Skivington in, until we play next week or until we play Bristol, who we've got next. So, yeah, I mean, we'll take it, but... I can't, don't think we can extrapolate from it. Yeah, I think it's one of those slightly frustrating games because it would have been a quite tight one. It would have been a good, a good match, match up to see what Gloucester were going to be good at, what they would maybe struggle with, and how well they would, how they, how well they would all come back from the break, and then it just turned into a bit of a nonsense game because any time Gloucester got the ball wide within. Worcester's 22, they would almost certainly score. Mm. Yeah. It's a bit mm. of a shame. It's easy, yeah. They had the, it was, you can kind of see um, that Cipriani still got his sort of th- um, attacking structures in there. And I really like the, the, the pullback behind 12 um, in there. That, that works really well for Gloucester. His teams haven't really worked how to defend it. Um, so that will be really good for them to continue to use that option. Thorley was good on the wing, finished off nice tries. Louis Lamet. Did you shoot. see one of the things? Sorry, just to, to pick yeah. up on, I thought was absolutely awesome. I don't know if you guys saw this. Was pretty much just after Reece Lamet had got on the pitch, he had the ball in the twenty-two. He, I think it must have been fumbled or something. He picked it up, he kicked it long, he chased it, he tackled their wing. I don't know who it was. I think it was McGregor. Right as he got the ball got to the ground, released over it, won the penalty. And right. that's something that you really don't see very often, especially from a winger of that size and of that age, because he's a small boy. And I just thought that was, that was awesome. That was probably my favourite bit of the whole match. Yeah, so that, that one in particular was a really good example of these, how these new laws are going to change, gen, like genuinely going to change actual tactics of the game, because not being able to do a couple of rolls on the ground, um, as far as that, that player who's caught the ball, if you get caught isolated and that defend, the player who's chasing the kick is smart, he can very, very easily turn you over because you can't do anything to protect yourself. You really, really have to have somebody there to support you or to hold yourself up longer before you go to grounds having caught the ball and being tackled. Um, but and on, on Reece Summit more generally, he is no longer a boy. He is very big over lockdown. And he's playing, we, we saw the talent, we saw the speed and we saw that finishing ability, but he's much, much more rounded than we saw. He's not quite Johnny May levels. There's a reason that he's not starting. But what, what a back three Gloucester now have uh, with yeah, him. It's great. And he's actually really mature. I mean, he's 19, but he plays like, like that kick and chase. He's a mature player. I mean, I'm not sure if he's, I think he's second in try scored in the Premiership so far this season. He's up there, yeah. He's up there, second or third. Like to say that it's his big debut season 
Like he's done really well. Um, and I think just to have, I know he's not going to maybe start as much, but he's 19 and to have to learn from someone like Johnny May is actually going to be probably better than him necessarily starting week in, week out. He's actually going to learn an awful lot from some, having someone like Johnny May there. They're going to get rotated a lot, aren't they? With all these games we've got in this in this period, it's it's one of those times where, and when May went off after however long he's on the pitch, and you're thinking, oh Christ, you know, you don't want a player of that calibre going off that early. Bring Ray Sammer on, no problem. So it's it's one of the areas that we're really strong at the moment. Yeah, well, obviously we hope he gets better as soon as possible, but you'd imagine that Reece Samet's got another three weeks of starting now that May's got at least two weeks out with the um, mandated okay. concussion test, and it did look quite bad. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, obviously, we fingers crossed he's not too bad, but I wouldn't be surprised to see Reece Samet starting a few games now. Mm. Johnny uh, May might come back and think he's a flanker again. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that'd be funny. Um, just very quickly on Worcester, it's quite hard to say. For my, I only saw the highlights. I was out for the day, so didn't really see a lot of Worcester in attack. But again, it, they're gonna. I feel like they're gonna be very similar to Irish this year. And I'll talk and I'll save my point on that uh, in a moment when we do bring up Irish. Uh, just very quickly, good to see that Jack Singleton got a try on his debut. Great job from him. Uh, moving on to the top of the table, uh, Exeter got a win, a twenty-six thirteen win. Pretty efficient extra uh, play. They took a while to get in the game. Tigers had a 6-0 lead after a, a, a couple, quite a few minutes, about 20 minutes in, I think, and then eventually they got over. Stuart Hogg's try was absolutely beautiful. Beautiful running lines. I don't know who the winger was, the other winger for Leicester, but he just had no gas. I don't know what happened to him. It was just far too easy for Hogg to get in behind him, just, rap, just literally walk past him. Um, but I don't know if you've seen this, Lance, but what do you see Karen Dickey vomiting on someone? Did you see that? Not what it was. I thought it was just spit, but oh, yeah. yeah, but it, yeah. Looked a bit, it looked a bit thicker than spit, bless him. But brilliant. I loved his po- I loved his poach mass interview as well. With his I think he's I think he's knocked his tooth out or something. He yeah. just he's fucking he great. Awesome farmer. <laughs> yeah, he, he just suits extra to a T. <laughs> um but he was good. Um as I say, I only really saw the highlights of this, but it just looked like a very similar extra performance. Um Johnny Gray looked good in the lineup, just nicely slotted in there. But because he's with uh, other guys that are massive, he just kind of just slots in nicely there. Fucking hell. Dave Ewers on haircuts alone is big. Flipping heck. He's got even bigger. He is fucking yeah. huge. I think one of the commentators descri- described him as a Jersey cow. And I think that is um, very fitting. Like no one when he scored that try. No. I mean, just you're just not going to stop him. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, it's not... Exeter aren't really very surprising anymore. We know exactly what they do. And they did it again and they did it well. A couple of moments of real amazing skill to score Hulk's try and to get themselves into the sort of red zone, as some teams call it. And then just brutal, brutal forward play to get themselves over the line. I think, I, I would say though that I watched the first half um, and I kind of had the kind of second half on in the background as I was watching the bath match. And actually Leicester in the first half didn't look too bad. Um, mm. They were definitely the second team. I think their centres and their back back three will take some gelling for, it will take a while before they gel properly, but they didn't look too bad. I think you could see that they, they, there was a solid forward pack who were well drilled um, in the first half and, I think kind of like, I don't know, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, but hopefully Borthwick can turn a corner with them. Yeah, there, there's, some, there's some clear evidence there that Borthwick's getting, has got something in there. They're, they're clearly seemingly better than they are. And George Ford's going to be crucial for them going forward to keeping, that, keeping Alice Genge fit. How much rugby he can play is going to be key and what they've got behind him is going to be another thing. But... Leicester and Irish, to an extent, were both the two outlying teams that weren't full strength. They would some guys in there that would start, but there was a lot of guys that probably wouldn't start new, usually. Um, so, yeah, Leicester, I'd say that's a not a bad result for them, to be honest. Extra at home. Um, yeah, I mean, they'd be annoyed not to get a bonus point because they probably could have probably might have deserved one. But... Yeah, they seem a little bit better than they were when they were struggling before the um, before the restart. 
I think we knew that they weren't going to win this game. So it's probably a bit of a, and as much as they simply weren't going to win this game. And whatever Borthwick is capable of, it's not going to happen immediately. Whatever ha- whatever's happening with Lee Blackett at Wasps is not what you'd normally expect with a new, with a new coach. Mm. So it's going to take a bit of time uh, for Leicester to get back um, or sort of to grow into whatever Borthwick is instilling in them. But for now, it's not a terrible result, really. As you say, losing bonus point would have been kind of their their best case scenario outcome for this game. So to not get that is a bit of a shame. They didn't. They denied exit to the bonus point themselves, which is, oh no, they didn't, because of the penalty try. But anyway, they they were competitive for some of the game, um, and there's there's things to be optimistic about at least. Um, a team that um, was a bit annoying, they didn't get a bonus point, and I wish they bloody did, um, was uh, London Irish uh, going down classically uh, to Bath away. Uh, we haven't beaten Bath in the last decade, I think. Yeah, 11 and games. 11 league good. games, you haven't, you haven't beaten us. And we weren't even in it. I'm, I'll, I'll part me. I'll, let's, get, let's do the positives of the game. Johnny, you do the positives, and then I'll do the negatives. So the battle of the Johnnies on Saturday, Bath Irish <laughs> at the wreck. I've one thing very quickly to say: the wreck looked massive without anyone in it. It looked that pitch was just clo- I don't know what, I don't know what, why your brain sort of changed. But for me, I was looking at the pitch. And I was like, Irish are going to be screwed. This so big. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, go with the bar of positives, and then I'll come out with the Irish down. Actually, one positive is the pitch. It it's not. It didn't seem to be a complete mess as it was oh, for the first half of the season. Um, Positives, our new guys did well. Spencer, great try. And he just looks, he, you can just tell he's a really class player. And like, he should be in the England setup, kind of right there instead of Willie Hines, personally. Like, he he was just absolutely class. Um, and then actually our pack did really well. I mean, Tom Dunn scored two tries from a rolling ball. Walker scored another. If Tom Dunn stayed on, he could have got his hat trick, which was a shame. Um, and from a Bath perspective, they did look kind of an all-round good good performance. Um, they did stall a bit. They seemed to tend to get to kind of three tries and then wait about forty minutes before they get their bonus point. They seem to they seem to want to do that a lot. Um, but yeah, no, they look good. Um, and kind of they weren't. A, against kind of the best Irish side um, but it is about getting off the mark and letting our new guys have a have a good go um, uh, and there wasn't much change in that in that team um, uh, but yeah no it was a solid performance I'd say Bath were probably one of the best teams of the weekend there was a couple of mistakes Priest and drop one but the heart the sort of you want to sort of summarize this game in one th- th- tiny three second thing it was when Ben Urbano comes off the bench about 50 minutes in and he just destroyed Kepu. And I mean, absolutely ran over the top of him. Like, it hurt poor old Motu Matu was in down for ages because Kepu just got absolutely buggered. Um, and then quickly, um, you just saw Ke- Kiss was like, get him off, get him off, get him off. And, they, and then they hoiked him off afterwards because Kepu wasn't, I mean, he was, re- he was good for that 45 minutes, I think, but... He, he, bless him, he's not at the races yet, and that's probably his age as well. But just, uh, it's hard to be very ne- not negative about Irish because we were just absolutely rubbish. We, and I'll make this point later at the pot at the end, and we can pick up on this later. But uh, there's going to be a few teams, I think, with this restart that because there's no relegation, they are just going to go to teams that they don't particularly want to play there. And just go, we'll see, let's see how we get on. Because Irish looked like a side that didn't want to be there. They just wanted to get through the game. And I appreciate it was wet. They weren't at full strength, but they were, looked at like a team that just didn't really want to be there and just wanted to kind of just get through the game and get off. There was, pa- there was patches where they looked good. Sean O'Brien going forward at sevens is exciting because he did bring a little bit of class. Like he won a couple of turnovers. He's got a lovely inside ball. Irish was sort of attacking the inside of Bath, which was quite good, and we had some gains down there. But the lineout was absolutely appalling, absolutely appalling. Like we didn't. I don't. I think maybe Coleman's injured or he's not at full um, 
full fitness yet, but we need him back in. We need Simmons as soon as humanly possible because, and actually we need Crevy as soon as possible at hooker um, or start Matt Cornish, who I'll talk about in a moment. But yeah, our lineup was appalling. Yules and uh, Stook, when he came on, put them under pressure, but it was, we won two lineouts in the second half out of 11. We had so much possession in the second half and we should have really got back in the game and it just couldn't get anywhere. Uh, Joseph scored a beautiful try in the corner, which was nice. Very good finish. Loose defending from Irish. Um, but I will say, like, one po- the, f- the one positive was Irish is we weren't at full strength, and that's a real thing we can take home, and Irish fans listen to this. We were definitely not at full strength. Um, we're going to have players that are going to come back in. We've got better players going to come in off the bench. We coped well enough. Paddy Jackson was all right at 10 for the first time. Um, but... The only other, the only shining light Irish can have is Matt Cornish, the 24-year-old we signed from Ealing, trail finders, comes off the bench with about 15 to go. First carry he does, he goes 25 metres unopposed. And I was like, he's going to flip and score. Couldn't believe it. Actually got the line out working and then he got himself a try. I was buzzing. Like, what a great, that was our one highlight of the game. But Irish, move on. We'll play, I think we've got Northampton next week. Uh, Yeah, we've got Northampton at home. I don't particularly know where that is actually at the moment. I need to check that because we're not, we're definitely not Brentford, but yeah. Sorry, I've moaned about Irish, but there you go. You're at Quinns. You were sharing with Quinns. So oh, that's, that's it. Of course we are. Yeah, we're the Stoop. <laughs> I do you think um, another, hi- another sort of not quite highlight, but reason to be optimistic for Irish is that uh, Ben Ben Donnell looked okay. Probably not long term a second row, but a young a guy. Flanker, yes. Who, Looked looked good enough, let's say. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. Sorry, he was another one I did forget to. Me- well, I wanted to mention. Yeah, it's good. There, there's enough in there for Irish to sort of go. Oh, they're gonna get. They will cause some teams on on problems with attack. Ben Loader was good again, quick when they when he got, when they got the ball. But yeah, just we need the bigger. We need our big internationals back in there and see how, what happens. Um, Bristol Saracens, very quickly, because this was very uneventful, lots of scrums, lots of nothing really happened, and then they got a penalty try, which was b- pretty clear and obvious, to be honest. Yeah, and they and they got a try. Dis- I thought Luke Morahan's disallowed try was definitely a try. There was a big kind of flurry that Otoje got blocked, but looking back on it, Never I don't it, think Otoje was ever going to make that tackle. I mean, it kind of was a block. I, I knew, yeah. Yes. I knew they weren't going to give it because of, yeah, letter of the law. It, it probably technically is, but he pro- he wasn't going to get there. So it's tough, but I, I think it's probably the right decision in the end, even though it's unfair on Bristol. So it's probably a good thing that they did actually win the game. And I, and I think it was unfortunate because the conditions that it wasn't great conditions at all. Hence, kind of scoreline and all the kicking. Bristol's kicking game in the first half. It improved in the second half, but they were kicking to kind of nothing in the first half and letting Saracens run it back at them and kick it back at them, which didn't look great. Um, and you weren't. Gonna, it wasn't a game for Semi Radrada to kind of have some big offloads and big runs, unfortunately. But it was it was a good win against a what what was pretty it wasn't a full strength Southampton side but if you looked at their team it was a pretty good pretty good side they put out. I just on your semi Randrada point I feel like I feel I th- they're, they're clearly saying it to get people's reactions and like me they triggered it the commentators in both like the Sale game and the Bristol game were like oh semi Randrada and Manu Tuilagi haven't done anything I was like have they not really had the ball. Yeah. Like, and it's, yeah, it's the first game after restart. There was no one going like, oh, George Ford didn't win Leicester the game or Flick and Eck, Jack, um, Stuart Hogg didn't carry 250 metres. Johnny Gray didn't take 5,000 line outs. But then they were like, oh, Manu Tuolangi didn't run, run over 500 people or Semi Randrada didn't offload through his legs. Like, I thought it was a bit harsh, to be honest. Like, Randrada is clearly one of the best players in the world. And I think, I think they've got a bit on him too quick. If it Brad Shields can offload through his legs. <laughs> if Brad Shields can offload through his legs, then I think Sam <laughs> Red <Monica. laughs> Yeah, that was very impressive. Do you want to move on to the Bristol, actually, then? You've mentioned Brad Shields, because I've, I've got nothing else to say on the Bristol Saracens game. Go on, Harry. Give us the Wasps. They look good. 
Wasps are good. Mm. And it's good to have a team that's good. They're not great. <laughs> they're not bad. They're just good. <laughs> like, they're, they're, they're definite. I mean, we, we talked about it a bit on, was it Friday when we did? No. Wednesday. Wednesday, we did the last pod. Um, we talked about the, the good sign, the sort of green shoots, let's say, that Lee Blackett was putting together. Um, and it was always going to be interesting to see whether, because it's all well and good coming in, having been an assistant coach, coming in and then taking charge of a team that is quite talented um, and getting a few results out of them. But then running this, whatever this weird preseason has been, being the figurehead of a pretty big club with some big name players that are expecting a lot of their coach. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah. Can I very, just very quickly say on before, if you wanted to talk about the players, I, I, I'm, and I'm really think, I don't want to like trigger people on this. I think Lee Blackett's the real deal as a coach. Like we, we do talk about like players like, Oh, Louis V. Sanit's the real deal. He is. Peter Munger Jensen's the real deal. He is. But I think Lee Blackett needs to be given a lot more credit than he's been given. Like, it's an insane turnaround what he's done at Wasp. And I think maybe it's because he's got the players playing in the right direction of how much he's done. But fair play to him. Like, he could be a seriously, seriously good coach. I don't think it's... It's not an enormous turnaround when you take the full picture into account. Um, Gopeth was injured earlier in the season... Uh, Minotzi was taking a bit of time to settle in. Uh, Wanga struggled at the stars, well, didn't he? Obviously, Sopawanga had his had his issues. Fekitoa wasn't quite integrated very well, um, and also had his injury issues. Um, and obviously, players like players like Willis and Thomas Young, are, are, they just get better every game. So I think there's not really. I think the playing the playing staff has improved at Wasps over the course of this year. So it's it's no no question. Um, Lee Blackett is doing a great job. I don't think he's light years ahead of um, Dai Young. I think Dai Young doesn't. It would it would be a disservice to what Dai Young did. And Wasps were competitive, if not particularly good, uh, with Young. They just went through a really bad run, which led to him being sacked. So. I think it would be a disservice to say that Blackett's doing anything revolutionary with this squad. It is a good, it's a it's a good squad with good players who've come back from injury, and sort of through another, various other means are now playing as well as they're capable of. But yeah, Blackett certainly deserves credit. And he and yeah, definitely. And I think kind of just see see what happens. I mean, he's thirty seven. I mean, he's the same age as Jimmy Gopper, who came off the what pitch. I mean. And he, he he could be playing, yeah. uh, probably a bit of a push. But like, yeah, it's it's really nice to see. I mean, he doesn't look thirty-seven. He looks like he's he's under some stress and he's aged a bit. But older than that. Like like me. Um. Uh, <laughs> but um. <laughs> like it, it it was quite impressive. And the one thing that really impressed me was just some of the players were great from start to finish, and they kept going and they kept on pushing. And even when Northampton came back. There was quite a lot of resilience in that team to kind of push back at Northampton. Like Willis and Young oh. in the back row, like just so disruptive. And I mean, the, Northampton didn't actually concede that many penalties. Um, it was only seven or eight in the whole game for Northampton or something, something like that. But they were great at disrupting them and just nicking the ball from them and kind of taking the pace out of the game. I think Bigger just looked rattled at points. Yeah, he was crap. Yeah, he weren't great. It wasn't, it wasn't he likes to take it into contact. Yeah, he wasn't great though. Yeah. Wasn't. Four decisions there where he took it into contact and just got munched. Um, can we pull our Ruck and Mall podcast special like England gun and say Jack Willis has to get picked for England? Like it has to be in a squad or something soon. So you've got Tom Curry, 22, yeah. 7. Jack Willis, 23, 7. Sam Underhill, he's only 24, also a 7. I mean, go back 10 years ago and everyone was like, oh, we haven't had a 7 since Neil back. And now we've got three pretty good 7s. <laughs> he's ridiculous. I, I don't think it's ridiculous that 
I know we've we've put it on our social media stuff today, but yeah, Willis is good, but those other guys are really, really good <laughs> in the World Cup final. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like it's all well and good playing like this against Northampton on a Sunday in Pissing August man. Wasps and being the best player on the pitch, but it is a it is a different level in an international rugby and obviously it's it go. Be, yeah. So we, we have to give him a go. I think he should be in the squad this autumn, but I don't think people should be offended if he's not. I, I would ha- really hate for him to become a Cipriani type. Has to be, why is he not in the team? It's ridiculous. He's not yeah, in the yeah, team. Yeah. Too good to not be in the team. I really hate when that happens with England because totally agree. The, guys, the guys that are in the shirt already are amazing. They are brilliant. They're some of the best players in the world at that position. We have another one, yeah, but he's... He's got time. He's had some serious injuries. He's playing very well. Give him a go. See if he plays that well for England. And then we can move forward. But he's not He's not a nailed-on starter yet. He he just reminds me a little bit. Of, maybe with Ted Hill, you know, when they pulled the gun on Ted Hill in Japan and then he wasn't that particular because they picked him off scoring two tries against Leicester off the bench. I think Willis is actually... A, Ted Hill was a fantastic rugby player and he's a hell of a lot better than us. Uh, me and Johnny, whoever were in the, in the back row, but just looking at very niche things like Jack Jack Willis, it, I, I, he's been so good this year. He's had such awful with injuries. His body position, like one of the, I, he, I think he generally gets in the best body position, like a Lachlan Bosch here, where he just can't get, no one can get him off the ball. He's probably got a better body position than maybe Curry and Underhill, like consistently over the ball, um, if we're going to go yeah. that detail with it. But again, he's definitely someone that in there. Just a very last quick thing for me. I did want to mention him. Um, I really think Lima Sopawanger at 15 is the way to go for Wasps. He also looks absolutely massive. Like, he's been it's in the gym. That short, is it? Yeah, but... Apart, apart from, the, from the yellow card after maybe two minutes. Oh, yeah, I didn't see that. What happened there? Sorry, very quickly, what happened? He anything? basically went for an intercept and it was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was an intercept he wasn't going to go. He wasn't gonna get. Um, uh, he could have got it, but he yeah. didn't. Close. Yeah, extra yard of pace, you might have got there. Fair yeah. Enough. There you go. Right, that is episode thirteen of uh, the Ruck and Mall podcast completed. Um, we're going to finish right there because Harry Berryman's itching to go and watch United lose to Sevilla. Uh, Seville. Um, maybe I don't know. We'll see. Um, as I say, oh, yeah. thank you again for listening and engaging with our stuff on social media. If you don't do it already, please do follow us on Instagram and Twitter, especially Instagram. We're really trying to grow the platform as much as we can. Uh, tell your mates about it. We really want to see how far we can go with this, so please give us that. Uh, we'll be back on next weekend for the review of Super Rugby AU games and the Premiership games. Uh, stay in um, contact with ourselves, or as I say, on our social media platforms, as we will do our players of the week on there. We also do our team of the week, team of the week, uh, team of the tournament, I should say, some Super Rugby RTROA and um, our predictions on there as well. So, um, yeah, lads, another good one. I'll see you, uh, see you next week. See you. See you, lads. Have a good week.